the man of the hour, uh, teaches, trains, and lectures doctors all over the world. He's in his 31st year of clinical practice, incredible family man, and awesome mentor, the incredible Dr. Bob Rakowski. Well, Carol, thank you always for the beautiful introduction, for running the show, for monitoring the chat, and just for making our wonderful world better as only you can. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, 31 years now in clinical practice, I've had the joy of seeing all ends of the spectrum, elite professional athletes, uh, world champions from every sport, uh, and people sent home to die. And, you know, one thing that I'll tell you is this concept of post-traumatic stress uh, is elusive to a lot of practitioners. So it was fun to dig into this this week and, and find some alternative approaches that for many people have been profoundly healthy. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I was actually on the road teaching a live event this weekend. It actually felt so good to be in front of a live audience. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever be back to as it was before, but I, I love sharing great information. We'll start out with some very basics about our brain, because that's really where the stress is going to be processed. But not just in the brain, we'll also share that your body can store memories of stress as well. But Inc. Magazine says that our brain is more powerful than every computer ever created combined. So I want you to think about that. There's a lot of good to that. You look around at all around us and you see so many great things that have been created. And it's as a result of this beautiful brain. And, and the reason I mentioned that up front is we have the capacity to heal from even sometimes uh, unimaginable traumas. You know, I feel very blessed that I, I really <clears throat> haven't had too many traumas in my, my life. I, you know, probably the worst thing I, I went through was, you know, holding my sister's hand as she died, uh, you know, killed in an automobile accident. That was, that was pretty harsh. Uh, and, you know, I've had friends die as well, but that still pales in comparison to what so many people have been through. Uh, I definitely have a level of compassion uh, and I, I want to lead people towards a better path of health. Uh, this is a pretty interesting picture of, of some of the connections in the brain. I don't know if it was an artist rendition or one of those amazing uh, sites. But when I talk about the brain, I like to show how absolutely beautiful it is. Uh, and this term neuroplasticity, this works for us and against us. <clears throat> if you keep recycling negative thoughts, you actually rewire your brain to make it easier to have those negative thoughts. Uh, and if you start on a more positive direction and really reinforce that, you can wire your brain and structure your brain for that more positive direction. Daniel Amen is uh, now a world-renowned psychiatrist. This was a TED Talk that he did almost 10 years ago. And the title of it was, What I Learned After 83,000 Brain Scans. And, and quite simply, what he learned is that you can change your brain. Uh, he has now done over 200,000 brain scans. And what he'll tell you is even if it's a physical trauma, we can start doing many, many more things to get past that. Or the emotional trauma, we can also do, again, many, many more things to get past that. Uh, and this book was a classic, The End of Mental Illness. He said, you know, what if mental health and brain health were one and the same? So the simple takeaway from this is they're, they're very tightly related. And the more things that you do are that are healthier for the physical health of your brain, which by the way, I'll call the hardware, the better the software, the mental health will actually work. So here are some brain scans. Uh, here we start out with a healthy brain. Then we have one that has classic post-traumatic stress disorder. Then we have a traumatic brain injury, and then we have traumatic brain injury coupled with post-traumatic stress. Uh, but maybe the key point here is that post-traumatic stress disorder is an emotional injury to the brain. We can see it on brain scans. We can see it in terms of changes of the brain structure. <clears throat> and therefore, you know, there, there's no denying, uh, as some people did in the past, believe it or not, they'd say, oh, come on, it's all in your head, get over it. Uh, that is a, a, a cold and even inaccurate and ridiculous point of view. People that appear, experience extreme stress and they transition into this post-traumatic stress, uh, there's many things that they will need to do to get their health and their life back. So when you start looking at the diagnostic criteria, 
uh, you know, there's several things that are associated with this uh, and it's exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, sexual violence uh, in one or more of the following ways. And they go through that, but then there's the presence of intrusive symptoms that keep coming back with the event. Uh, and it's really, really hard to avoid stimuli associated with the trauma. And then oddly enough, the, the criteria is it has to exist for a month or more, and then suddenly it qualifies as post-traumatic stress. I think that's an upgrade from previously, they used to think it was six months. So, you know, we're, we're beginning to realize that if something is significant enough, within a month, our brain and body can start to have these experiences. <clears throat> so there can be nightmares, loss of appetite, difficulty concentrating, uh, social isolation, isolation, drug use and abu abuse, fearfulness. Uh, I talked earlier today, I, I have an earlier uh, Ask the Doctor, which is more uh, questions and answers and questions that were sent in from the week before. And interestingly enough, one of the more effective medications that they use for post-traumatic stress is that which creates a type of amnesia when people sleep. So at least they are free from nightmares. Now, when I was talking about that, uh, one of the individuals on the call that had a very significant post-traumatic stress issue, he said, you know what, his nightmares he felt actually helped him to process the stress and come to grips with it. So uh, we probably want to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. This is a very recent publication and they start looking at so many different things that we can see uh, and many of these things we can measure in the lab. So the behavioral markers, you know, you, you can obviously observe that. And probably the starting point is going to be some level of exposure to trauma, whether it's direct or someone you know. And I'll even show you that some people are developing it from spending too much time uh, in front of the bad news, which by the way, really covers the news that's on TV. Uh, hormonal markers. So you start looking at cortisol, the chronic stress hormone, and then these major brain signaling and stress molecules that, that we see accompanying with that. The immune markers, these are most dynamic. And what this does is it actually sets the body in a chronic inflammatory state with suppression of the immune system. So I, I had a consult this afternoon with a woman that's battling stage four cancer. Uh, and, and she asked me outright, you know, she had a, an extreme stressor as a child that she doesn't feel that she ever got over. And she said, do you think that could have something to do with it? Uh, and, you know, I, I have a very high level of confidence that if you do have an unresolved trauma and chronic stress, that is certainly one of the components of the perfect storm of cancer. And, and, you know, as I've taught that over the years, I tell people the perfect storm of cancer, what conditions set up cancer, low oxygen, low nutrients, high acid, chronic inflammation and immune suppression, usually secondary to chronic distress. Uh, Post-traumatic stress can set up all of the factors of the perfect storm of cancer. When they start looking at genetic markers, they come to realize that there are some people that are just more prone uh, to having post-traumatic stress. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Your genes create your vulnerability, but epigenetics or what you do with your genes are the vast majority of the responsibility, 90 to 95%. So even if you're uh, significantly stress vulnerable, there are proven strategies to become more stress resilient. Uh, and then we look at these other markers and they find areas of the brain that are, are certainly impacted. And this first one stands for the hypo, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So uh, this is how the brain triggers the adrenal glands to keep a chronic stress response. Uh, and those of you that have heard me talk about the, the stress reset, one of the things I often recommend is melatonin every waking hour because it actually buffers this drive of the chronic stress on the body uh, and, and can even reduce the overall inflammatory process. So my last associate doctor was actually at the Boston Marathon when this bomb went off. Uh, now, very, very fortunately, she was nowhere near the explosion 
But she said they knew there was explosion. They thought something was really, really wrong. And what did they do? They just got out of there as quickly as they could. And, and that made good sense. Uh, and so there was a follow-up study, you know, who suffered more post-traumatic stress, the people that were actually at the, the marathon, or was it people that watched six or more hours of the coverage on TV? Uh, and that is exactly what they found out. If people kept reliving the trauma, and, and the news can do it so many different ways and from so many different angles, and they can probably, unless you were exactly blasted by the bomb, they could make it much worse uh, than if you were there at the event. And, and the news tends to do that. So one of the philosophies on the news is if it bleeds, it leads. And, and that's how headlines are created. And there's a reason for that. You know, we are more wired to avoid pain than we are to seek pleasure. We're wired for both, but there's a lot more uh, driven biologic desire to avoid things that are painful. So we think we need to know about this bad stuff in order to avoid it. But in reality, what we do is we inundate our psyche with bad, bad news. So uh, Michelle Guion, I think that's how you pronounce her last name, uh, wrote this book, Broadcasting Happiness. Uh, and when she was a young girl, she thought, you know what? I really would love to be a television newscaster. So she did all of these amazing things and created this beautiful education and voice lessons and everything else. And she got her job as a news anchor woman. Uh, and it wasn't too many months before she thought, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought it was. I can't do this. And she left. Uh, and what she really did not like was there was a constant broadcast of complete and total negativity. So her book, Broadcasting Happiness, tells that story and, and really gives us the idea, you know, we really want to focus on, on happy. Ultimately, you know, imagine if you were really, really good at focusing on happy, do you think post-traumatic stress would settle in on you? Uh, everybody's going to have stressors, but I'll show you the stats on how many people drift into post-traumatic stress. But the study and the data suggest that it's highly avoidable. So when we look at this concept of nature versus nurture, uh, I mentioned epigenetics and you know, cancer tends to be the, the hallmark condition where we talk about it's a genetic problem. And they talk about these different things like the BRCA genes saying, oh my gosh, you know, if you have this, you should probably get a double mastectomy and both ovaries removed like Angelina Jolie. Uh, but reality is those genes have been in the human genome since humans have been around. So, you know, why is it that so many more people are getting so many more cancers? Well, it's the environment. Uh, and again, that environment of stress certainly uh, does not help the cancer process. So Chuck Swindoll said this, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to it. Uh, and I think he said that before we actually had the data coming in on epigenetics. So some stroke of insight, I believe he's right. You know, 90 to 95% is going to be our reaction. So there is this post-traumatic stress, and there's also post-traumatic growth. So ultimately you look at that and sometimes people go through a very extreme circumstance and they actually use it to launch it into a sense of growth and a better way to serve humanity. Now, if you have a more healthy brain, a more healthy body, a more healthy social support system, those are all things that I would categorize in the environment that would help you to move more towards that post-traumatic growth. So we'll go back to Napoleon Hill. I think this was published 1937. Here's what he said. Opportunity often comes disguised in some form of misfortune or temporary defeat. So he's talking about something a lot more mild than a, an extreme uh, post-traumatic stressor. But nonetheless, it's been known that bad things can often lead to good things. Uh, Oscar Wilde said this, what seems to us as bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. Uh, and there's a reason I'm, I'm going on this sequence because John D. Martini uh, is a very interesting sage of wisdom. I, I met him in the 1980s. Uh, he has a, a seminar series that he's done, I don't know how many thousands of times, nearly every week of the year. 
called his breakthrough experience. Uh, I did it, I believe, in 1990 in a, in a private session in his office, which at the time was Houston, Texas. You know, now he travels all over the world. And I did it again in 2021. And he's added a lot to his breakthrough experience over that time. But based on, you know, we can often bounce back from things that are very, very problematic to us. You know, uh, this is exact quotes that I pulled from a recent podcast that he had. So I'll read it to you. He says, you know, oftentimes when, when things seem really, really horrible, as the years go by, they turn out to be terrific. So he asked the question, why not look right now and discover what's terrific about it? He says, it doesn't take time and space with the aging process to have wisdom. All you have to do is ask the right questions and be, become aware of it now. Uh, and <clears throat> so in the breakthrough sessions that I attended with him in person, again, I'm blessed that I didn't have any major post-traumatic stress, but some people had some very serious stressors. Uh, and Dr. Demartini will talk about universal laws like the law of polarity. And there's plenty of wis uh, sages of wisdom will, will say when something's really, really bad, there's an equal and opposite good within it. Uh, and he encourages people through a series of questions to find it. Uh, and I think we're all, all adults on here. So this is a very horrific topic, but he told a story about a woman who was kidnapped by a, a motorcycle gang uh, and gang raped over a long weekend uh, that went to his breakthrough series. And you know clearly that'd be a candidate for post-traumatic stress. But yet in asking the right series of questions, he got her to turn that around and actually see the good in it. You might ask what would be good? Well, she was much more protective of her daughters and, and, and made sure that none of that ever happened to them or, or anyone that she loved. And you know, there were many other things that came with it. And uh, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Uh, I should type in his website, drdmartini.com, or just type in the Breakthrough Experience, John D. Martini. If you're dealing with uh, uh, some type of major stress or post-traumatic stress, I would encourage you to do his Breakthrough Experience. Uh, and he has a huge track record of success. And, and what I like most about it uh, is it, it, it's not a multi-year process. Uh, it, it's usually two or three hours, uh, in, you know, in consecutive, you know, he gets on a case and he'll stay with it. And the interesting thing is the other people that are there are, are learning it. So again, I talked to this stage four ca cancer patient today. Uh, she's literally been in therapy for years. Uh, and, and I said, look, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. And she said, you know what, that sounds like to be exactly what I need. So Maybe someone will catch this information on the replay or anything else. But ultimately, what we want to do is help people get better fast whenever possible. So ancient wisdom from Buddhism, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Uh, and there's a sage of wisdom that I really like named Sadhguru. Uh, and he says, you know what, when, when we're having pain, it's not usually, and especially emotional pain, it's not that anybody's hurting us in the moment. What he says is we either keep replaying a bad memory over and over and over again, and essentially perpetuating the suffering of that bad event, or he says our, it's our imagination really constructing a very bad future. Uh, but if you can somehow get into the now and breathe and relax and find a little joy, and it might be as simple as petting your, your dog or you know, uh, I don't know, smelling a flower, you know, those life simple joys can be pretty amazing. And then imagine if you can get into that now, why not expand the now, expand that level of consciousness and, and constructively reduce the amount of stress that you're uh, experiencing. Uh, I One of the questions that came through prior to this was what about uh, memories that are stored in the body? Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I read a really good summary of this book. This doctor has dedicated his entire life to essentially releasing trauma stored within the body. The title of the book, The Body Keeps Scores, and he talks about how the brain, notice that that's different than the mind. Uh, the brain is the hardware, the mind is the software, and the body in, in healing and trauma. But this highlight here says trauma interferes with brain circuits that involve focusing, flexibility, and being able to stay in emotional control. A constant sense of danger and helplessness promotes the continuous secretion of stress hormones, 
which ultimately wreak havoc on the body and immune system, et cetera. So uh, ultimately, I, I, the part I wanted to highlight here is a constant sense of danger. So one thing we want people to know is we want them to feel safe, to be safe, to get in a safe and supportive environment uh, and do whatever they need to do uh, and realize parts of your body, actually the muscular system can lock in these tightened patterns. Uh, and one of the questions was, you know, uh, about releasing the psoas muscle hip flexors where many practitioners have talked about that. So when we're under threat, our body has a response of kind of like coiling into a fetal position and our hip flexors go in and our shoulders round forward, our heads go down and we often tend to protect ourselves those patterns can get locked in. And some of the yoga stretches where you're gonna be extending and stretching the hip flexors, very, very important. Uh, when we start talking about exercise, this was a 2021, what's called meta-analysis. So they looked at all of the available studies uh, and here's what they found out. Very, very simply, if you can add exercise to people's daily routine, uh, it is an effective uh, treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And notice what they said, greater amounts provide more benefits. So uh, I mean, within limits, right? So we don't necessarily want people exercising 10 hours a day, but having a consistent exercise routine is gonna be really, really good. Uh, you start looking at nutrition and PTSD, much less was available, especially with uh, very, very specific diets. But when they looked at people that suffered post-traumatic stress and followed their food, very, very simply, people that had poor diets uh, had much more symptoms of the post-traumatic stress. So think about that. Poor diet, you're not going to have the hard materials, the raw materials to create a healthy brain. And therefore, the brain is going to have a hard time having uh, healthy emotions and healthy thoughts. So quality uh, diet, very, very important for post-traumatic stress. Uh, and one of the things that's up and coming is going to be psychedelics, including things like psilocybin. Uh, and there is a lot of emerging research and some very sharp researchers that are showing that these things that seem to change the mind a little bit can be very, very powerful uh, at reducing some of the stressors within the body. Uh, Paul Stamets, the world's foremost authority on medicinal mushrooms, he will specifically call out psilocybin, but they're talking about it in terms of micro dosing. So not a toxic dose, not a dose that's gonna cause a problem, but just a, a micro dose that takes the edge off the stress. Uh, and by the way, they also called out cannabinoids. So uh, it seems like it was a few months ago, I was asked to do a research project on cannabis. Uh, and you know what, I, I knew nothing about it. And, and my bad, because cannabis is a superfood. It's been in medicinal use for thousands of years. Uh, if you haven't looked it into any great detail, it might shock you and maybe as much as it shocked me. Uh, but one, uh, one book I read was called The Marijuana Manifesto by Jesse Ventura. He's a, a governor uh, and his wife had severe seizure disorder where in spite of you know three different seizure meds, she was having massive convulsive seizures that were going to kill her. Uh, and someone said, well, you know, look, why don't you take her to Colorado and get her some medical marijuana? And he was desperate. And, and so he did it. And he said her very first dose of cannabis stopped her seizures. And within six months, she was able to wean off of her medications. I also read uh, a book called The Cannabis. And I said read, but I listened to the audiobook, The Cannabis Manifesto. And this was a 30 plus year cancer survivor uh, that has been a pioneer in cannabis research. And you know, medicine could offer him nothing. And interestingly enough, doing his own research, he thought maybe cannabis would help. And, and here he's alive 35 years later. So uh, nature's molecules tend to be really, really good. The medical model, not so good, except for maybe the, the medication that creates uh, memory loss at night. So you don't remember your nightmares. So with that said, that will bring us to our questions uh, and you know, I don't know if there's anything in the chat, but if there's anything, anybody has anything, I'm happy to answer it. Certainly. We'll start with the first questions that we have. 
uh, what are your thoughts about CMOS and is it okay to take long term? Are we talking like CMOS the green? So, you know, you start looking at, at, the, at these mosses and, and even algaes and they're considered superfoods. And as long as it's clean, sure. And, and so one of my running jokes in, in clinical nutrition, when I would teach people about greens, I'd tell them the rule in nutrition is about the same as the rule in finance. Green is good and you can't get too much. Uh, and people remember that joke. And, and so, you know, you, you start looking at these different variety of plants. They can be so good. They can be alkalizing. Anything that's green is going to have chlorophyll. The central molecule of chlorophyll is magnesium. Uh, magnesium is very, very calming to the brain and body. Uh, and, you know, the, the whole concern really about any sea vegetable is sea contamination. Uh, but they're certainly less contaminated than, than the deep fish. So, you know, sure, why not? If, if you enjoy it, uh, you know, go for it. Why not? Perfect. Next question uh, is followed up with in, underneath the next question. There's a comment from uh, Camilla. Are melatonin and L-theanine safe to take for the long term? Yeah, there's no known toxicity and, and even long-term dosing. And so... You know, one of the things that was uh, so fun when I had this consult with this cancer patient, you know, she had a really good team, uh, but she was not aware to the extent that melatonin is an anti-cancer substance. So now they know that even single-celled amoebas make melatonin. Uh, it blocks, you know, it's a modulator of the 10 hallmarks of cancer. Um you know, calms the body, mind, and spirit. It's a mitochondrial specific antioxidant. Mitochondria make 94.4% of human energy and, you know, right on down the line. So what I will tell you is, yeah, melatonin for sure. And then we look at theanine. Theanine is an amino acid in green tea. Uh, it's a natural GABA facilitator. Uh, there's over a thousand studies on green tea and its anti-cancer benefits uh, and theanine, they just found was, was the most calming part of that plant. Green tea has caffeine. And they thought, well, why don't people get hyped up on green tea? And then they figured out it was the theanine. So theanine is, is good for very calm focus without drowsiness. Uh, happy, beautiful evening, everyone. Um, I have a 38-year-old uh, uh, business partner that recently had a blood test as part of a routine checkup came back with clean except for elevated levels of triglycerol and liver enzymes. Non-smoker, healthy weight, but has been drinking on and off above recommended guidelines. Uh, what can be done to help cleanse and protect the liver? Well, we certainly wanna stop what's bothering the liver, right? Uh, and, and so <clears throat> what's, what's so interesting, triglycerides, triacylglycerol, they, they call them the same thing. Interestingly enough, it's two names for the same molecule. So. Uh, whenever the liver has excess amount of carbohydrate, which by the way, alcohol is a you know, fairly simple sugar, uh, it converts to triglycerides. And the first tissue that becomes over fat is actually the liver. That's called fatty liver. Now in the past, or, or sorry, recently, they've defined something called non-alcoholic fatty liver, but it sounds like this person might actually have alcoholic fatty liver. Uh, and <clears throat> so Claudio, I, I tell the story about my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and so when I was in school, we were required to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Uh, and I really didn't see the sense to it. And, and being very, very busy with lots of things going on, I thought, you know, I've got so much better things to do. But it may have been one of the most powerful and empowering hours of my entire life. Uh, I went in there and you saw every demographic. You saw literally Fortune 500 CEOs that lost their job, that lost their family, that lost their house, that for a time were living under a bridge. You saw people that overdrank and killed somebody and had to, you know, after jail time, had to live with the guilt and remorse and, and everything related to that. You saw women that were sexually assaulted because they couldn't control their, their alcohol consumption. Uh, and they all told their stories uh, and, and maybe more graphically than I ever wanted to hear, but every one of these people was totally committed to helping each other stay sober. Uh, and if you follow Ed Milet, 
Ed Milet's dad was uh, a severe alcoholic the first 15 years of Ed's life. And then he got sober and he says his dad was his hero and he saw that level of change and his dad helped hundreds of people stay sober. Uh, and, you know, I believe that this is one of the finest organizations out there and they have their 12 step program. And of, of course, you know, not everybody has the same faith, but they say, you know what, this might be on, be beyond you. So let's first and foremost, turn it over to God. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to share the original Alcoholics Anonymous prayer, uh, and then I'm going to share the modern uh, tweak of that. And, and so God get, grant me the serenity to uh, accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's the initial prayer. But the update, which resonates with me, God grant me the serenity to accept the people that I cannot change the courage to change the one that I can and the wisdom to know it's me uh, and how powerful. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, if we go by those guidelines, I, I think we're going to do pretty well. And so I, I have people that are patients that have done really well with Alcoholics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, uh, there's like Hard Drug Anonymous, they're, 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 any kind of addiction you could imagine. They have a support group for, uh, and you know, great experiences with them. Uh, and uh, the patients that I've sent, by the way, patients generally don't want to go. They don't want to admit they have a problem. And I tell them, make me promise that you'll just go to one meeting. I'm not going to ask you to go to any more. Uh, just go to one. And guess what? For many people, that one meeting was enough to start them on their path of sobriety. So you know, even if this person doesn't think they have a problem, I might suggest that. Much appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. What is the best a person with PTSD who has been on drugs for years, who wants to heal, can do for themselves with functional medicine? That's a really good question. And, and, and so the fact that you're seeking an option is a really good thing. And, you know, so many people with PTSD have turned to functional medicine because the, the drugs just plain don't work, you know? And, and what Daniel Amen found with his brain scans is they often perpetuate the problem. Now, Dr. Amen, as a psychiatrist is not opposed to medication, but he follows the guideline, lowest dose, shortest duration. So when people are in a really bad state and a medication uh, can keep them, you know, from, from being in a really severe crisis, that's a good use of medication. But ultimately, we want to heal the brain, and then we want to heal the mind, and then we want to heal the emotion. But the fast track, if this person is emotionally ready for it, you better, you got to be, because Dr. John Demartini, uh, you know what, he, he doesn't pull any punches. You know, when these people are, are, you know, going through their traumas, he'll say, I get that. I'm sorry that happened. Tell me what good resulted from that. And he will stick with it until they say something, say something, say something. And usually the first answer is there's no good, there's no good. And then suddenly they come up with a little good. Then they come up with a little more. Then they come up with a little more. And I'll tell you what, it, it could be hard in third person to hear that and imagine that that's possible. But I've seen it the two times that I was in person. And again, I was the observer because you know my trauma is so minimal compared to what so many people have been through but you see them get that breakthrough. And in 40 years of doing it, you know, he's helped tens of thousands in some very extreme cases. So the investment in the breakthrough is significant. Uh, you know, that, that's what I would go. And, and by the way, I just happened to read, so what's the best support of supplements? Stress reset, right? If we're talking about post-traumatic stress, we wanna do that stress reset. So Camila, big shout out to you. You know, we're, we're not about products on, the, on this call, but you've combined the melatonin, theanine and other adaptogens uh, and maybe even type in the chat where people can get that uh, and the Ganoderma spores, but then really good omega-3s for a better brain. And, and, you know, even when I showed about the diet, diet and exercise, really powerful. Now, the biggest challenge that I've seen over time is when people are in such a big emotional hole they just have a hard time getting out. So we've got to get people, you know, a, a support group as much as possible and take them for a walk or take them to the gym and, you know, make them a good meal and, and all those other things. And, 
you know, I, I like the word team together, everyone achieves more, but here's what we know, you know, we're, none of us are on, on an island. And, and I think maybe these last few years is, have helped us to realize we need community, maybe more than we ever have uh, in modern history. Uh, it's, it's been uh, a, a beautiful week, a wonderful day. I was glad to be back on the road again, teaching about the brain. So uh, maybe that's a good sign that the world is opening up. So uh, as always, good night all and God bless.